ever feel like you need to simplify things in your life? I'm sure none of you have ever had that thought, have you? <clears throat> That's what we're talking about today, the first healthy habit, simplicity. Uh, spiritual disciplines that we're talking about here uh, came to us from the ancient church fathers. The Christian discipline of si sim uh, simplicity is an inward reality that, is re that results in an outward action, an inward reality of God that then we can see in our lives. Ecclesiastes kind of sums up what we're like as people. Ecclesiastes 7.30. God made man simple. Man's complex problems are his own devising. Isn't that true? This week we're going to fo focus on simplicity and the ability to flee fruitless activity to center our lives around Jesus Christ. I recommend two books on the subject of spiritual disciplines and, and simplicity. Richard Foster, this is just like the, the main one that we all use. It's a great one. Celebration of Discipline. And then a newer one that's come out by Bill Hybels is Simplicity. So if you, if you want to read more, you can do that. You know, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but when I first became a Christian and sat in the pews here, I could go from Sunday to Sunday and hardly think about God. And it's because we get so busy. I was in college at the time. Of course, I was in college in the 60s. It was pretty wild on the campus where I went. And uh, so... I wasn't in touch with God until I come on Sunday and kind of get refocused. I didn't really have a consistent journey with God throughout my week. And maybe some of you today are in my same situation where you realize, yeah, I come, I get my, my little feeding on Sunday, and I go back home, and, and uh, I don't think about God the rest of the week. So when I, I started here at Colonial, I, uh, I heard a sermon that changed my life on fixing our eyes on Jesus. It was preached by our longtime uh, colonial lead pastor, Ted Nissen. And Ted was a person who consistently, for many of you who do know him here, of course, he was consistently centering the church around Jesus Christ and living for Jesus Christ every day, every moment. And so ever since that time, that has been our DNA, and we continue to this very day under Pastor Jim in doing this. And by the way, today is would have been Pastor Ted's 91st birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Pastor Ted. <laughs> He's enjoying the presence of Jesus Christ right now. Our scripture for today is the very one he preached on to me that really got me ignited from Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Why don't we stand and read it together? Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that would so easily entangle us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, that you may not grow weary and lose heart. May God bless the reading of his word to us today. I'd like to just deal with five principles of staying on target with Jesus Christ. You know, one of the first things that we see in this uh, passage is, as we read it and we were listening to it, <clears throat> it talks about the great cloud of witnesses that surround us. And it's really a reference back to chapter 11 where there's the great saints of all history that are mentioned there as examples to us. So we had that great cloud of witnesses that have been encouraging us and building us. These have been the examples of faith and the sacrifices of faith through the centuries. But you know, as we look around our congregation, we have examples of faith right here in our pews. We have people around us who have helped us, as Pastor Ted helped me in beginning my life of faith with Jesus Christ. We're surrounded by those people. And what I want to ask you this morning as we're going through each of these points is, who are you coaching now? Because I know we have a lot of people who have grown in their faith in Jesus Christ and part of what we're doing in bless is blessing others. And so this, I'm just 
piggybacking on what we've already been talking about. My life changed radically. I, I went from being a pew sitter, and I did sit right where Mary is sitting. I sat in the front row. That's trying to get as close to God as I could, I guess, uh, for fear I'd fall off the boat. But uh, I moved from being a pew sitter to a young uh, mentee of Pastor Ted. And you know, one thing I just love about Ted, and any of you would say the same thing that know him, he always kept the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing was Jesus. Could you ever talk to the man who didn't get something about Jesus? It's just what he did. In the church, we get off on all so many deep theological things, and somehow we th forget the deepest theological thing is Jesus himself and knowing Jesus Christ. So, so at Colonial, what Ted did is simply focused his life and his message on Jesus Christ over and over and over. Well, I got to know Ted, and it's, it's interesting how things happen in our lives and how we do get in mentoring situations. And the main reason I ever got to know Ted was I played handball. I was the class champion at UMKC. And so uh, he challenged me to a match when he heard that I'd played handball. And I thought I was really good, you know. Well, Ted, you know, I think he beat me 21 to 2 or something like that. <laughs> and, but that wasn't the, the best part of it. It was afterwards when you sit down and you talk. And uh, we were talking about my family and how n no one in my family was Christian. We were talking about how I was doing in my relationship with Jesus Christ. And it really began a lasting friendship. So having a coach is developing a relationship with someone and helping them to grow in faith. It became a lasting relationship and friendship for me. Ted knew Christ was on the move in our country at the time, in the early, uh, six, in the late 60s. And so, and he also realized that as, even though he had an inclination to, to work with youth, he didn't have the time to work with all the youth. And so he kind of looked around for a young disciple maker, and he found a guy by the name of Richard Beach who worked with Campus Crusade for Christ. Richard came here, instantly began to share his faith, began to lead hundreds of, of young people to Christ, and built a disciple-making system. He pushed me personally to read the Bible, communicate my faith with others, and share that faith effectively. It's the very thing we've been doing in Bless, isn't it? Discovery Bible studies. He taught us how to lead Bible studies and recruit other people. I was in a three-month training class being mentored by him there, and after it, there were 12 of us in the group, and we each paired up, and we had six groups, and we had 100 students that were in those groups at the time, multiplying, multiplying, and multiplying, leading new believers to Christ. It was during that time that I really began a daily quiet time where I spent time with God every, each and every day. My life radically changed. I had a prayer list, and I'd have 60 people on the prayer list and see many of them come to Christ daily. You know, we were in the midst of that time of the Jesus movement. We were seeing pe people all over the nation uh, having that happen. And so that seemed normal to me at the time. Now, it's not normal to us now in the United States, but it certainly is in India and China and Africa, the Middle East, many places in the world. And so it's time that we got caught up to speed on that. And some of the things we've been doing through the Discovery Bible Studies could be a key to that. It's time for most of us to be mentoring younger Christians. I think that that would be universally true of our church. It is easy to hang with your friends, and we've got a lot of wonderful Christian friends here. But there's, there comes a point where you've got to reach out, and that's what Richard and Ted taught me so importantly. And, and mentoring someone is just beginning a relationship and I, I was so flattered when Ted wanted, the old guy wanted to play, he wasn't even old then, you know, he's 44, I think. When he was going to, he was going to mentor me, you know, uh, by playing handball, and, and it's just that simple. Second principle that we're going to think about today, and this is a very important one, is in becoming Christ-centered, we need to learn to give up the encumbrances that are in our lives. The encumbrances are the weights, the busyness, the fruitless activities, and it, but it could be even good things. It could be the hobbies that we have, the interests that we have that we always go overboard on. 
Uh, or we might just sit down and say, Christ, what are the things in my life that maybe you need to clear out so that I can really be a part of your kingdom work that's going on around us? In our lives, we hold back because we are so busy, don't we? What areas of your life could you give up so that Christ might utilize yours in a new way? Some people, they're, they're only interested in seeking their careers. Others, popularity. Others want to be a big leader of someone else. This is a servant leadership that we're talking about here. But when I think of encumbrances, I think of the day we live in as the most encumbering time that we live in. And the reason I say that is um, we focus so much of our time in social media. Uh, so many of our waking hours are on our phones, our computers. In many ways, we're experiencing what God warned in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. You know, as the story goes, and you might reread it to think about, they were planning to build a great city with a tower that would reach into the heavens to make a name for themselves with one language. The Lord came down and investigated the city, and he saw that nothing that they would purpose in their hearts they could not accomplish to do. So God confused their languages and scattered them because he knew that they would, they would put the self-importance on their ability instead of on God's ability. And so he scattered them throughout the world at the time. I think God thinks the same thing about us, and particularly us in the United States. They were a developing informational society. Their pride, their talents, their new technologies were leading them away from God. We live in even a stronger information age, of course, where our knowledge is expanding at the quickest rates in the history of the world, and we're experiencing the modern-day Tower of Babel. I was shocked when my wife was telling me recently a quote from Mark Zuckerberg, you know, at Facebook. And he, said, he stated this, that the, that the church and the governments have not brought the world together, so through Facebook he would be able to do that now. Uh, you know, so many of the studies are interesting if you, if you want to really study something. The, the Internet is designed, by design, to be addictive. And to, you know, many people are addicted to it, can't stay away from it. If you're away from your phone, you, do, you, you feel uh, separation anxieties. I mean, some of the extreme cases and examples of people who are addicted to, the, to what is going on on the Internet is just frightening. Those who seek Jesus Christ must put aside the encumbrances of our time and focus their lives on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So what are the encumbrances that are in your life that maybe you could sit down with a quiet time before God and list off that you need to ask him to remove from your, your life? Maybe it's just less time on your phone or your computer. The third principle in becoming a Christ-centered person is to acknowledge our sin, confessing them regularly. Really, the closer we draw to Christ, the more we see the sin that's in our hearts. Today would be a great day for all of us, really, to confess our sins and ask forgiveness. But many people think it's okay to tolerate sin. A little sin, that isn't a big deal. The truth is that unconfessed and unrepented sin will eat us up. You know, do you ever get sick when you watch the news, but it all starts with sin? You know, all the news, you know, like, like, I couldn't even believe some of these cases that come across. Like, the, the couple that fed their child to a pig. Remember that? I mean, that's on, you know, it seems like it comes back every other week that it's, it's on, the trials keep going. But who in the world would do something like this except by their totally in the power of sin, underneath the power of sin in their lives? Jesus says, if we confess our sins, Jesus, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our nation is plagued by sin. I just encourage us all to take some time to reread the Ten Commandments. No other gods, no idols. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Honor your parents. Don't murder, or as Jesus illustrates, or don't do it in your mind. Don't murder someone in your mind. Don't commit adultery or don't lust after someone in your mind. Stealing, false witness, comfort, coveting anything that belongs to a neighbor. Sit down and think about that and apply it to yourself. And go humbly before God confessing your sin. To bring you back into a relationship or deepen the relationship you have with Jesus Christ. 
Examination of our lives is something that we need to do all the time, and we don't do enough uh, to gain the forgiveness that Christ offers. Uh, it's wonderful in our church that we have a lot of opportunities for help in this area, and Mary Brown is, is the leader of the pack in this. Uh, she has soul healing individual sessions where if you have sin that's got such a gra uh, grasp on your life that, that through the power of God you can be released from those things. She has another soul healing seminar coming up March uh, November 3rd and 4th. You could just give her a call and she could set something up for you. The fourth pr principle that I'm going to mention today in, in staying close to Jesus is to run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, I've, I've noticed how, how hard it is to endure because so many things can happen to us in, in, in our daily lives, can't they? Uh, we can be overcome and anxious about all the things that are in the world. You can watch, if you watch enough TV, you're going to get anxious <laughs> just by doing that. Anxiety is, is a major problem in the United States today that we face. We don't have the endurance to overcome the situations that we, that we encounter. I love C.T. Studd's quote, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. How are we going to run the race that we have on earth? None of us know the time we have. But will we run it all out to the glory of God? It is an endurance race uh, to the finish line. And, and as we're in that endurance race, we see what, what uh, God says about endurance. To rejoice, literally, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So we, we gain from the trials as we turn those trials over to God. And a lot of us have trials every day. A lot of you... As Mary just mentioned, the power is out at the house. You know, it's, it's, the power is out at the church about every other week also, by the way. Uh, so it gives us a chance to really get closer to God. I love what Jesus says, uh, you know, to encapsulate a couple verses from Matthew. Don't be anxious, but seek first the kingdom of God. And so I pray that for us all as we're here. A lot of us have strong, have strong have started strongly in our faith and have run other, uh, out of steam along the way. Others were slow to start and never really got going, and they're losing the race at the end. I love 1 Corinthians 9.25. Whoever competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way not as without aim. I box in such a way not just beating the air, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified. Uh, one of the great examples of doing this to me is uh, Ann Lashover. I don't know how many of you know Ann and Ron. But Ann, uh, I had the privilege of leading Ann to Christ when she was in high school and Anne was one of the smartest people that I've ever known in my life. And could just Anne was brilliant in work. For everything she did, she was perfect. And at 50 years old, she was diagnosed with early Alzheimer's. And uh, just this last week, she died at 57, 57 years old. And I was thinking I'd see her, and she could barely, you know, she, she and I were really good friends, and she would barely know who I was. But she was always trying. She was always reaching out. And then at the service I went to this week, I love what the pastors had to say. She couldn't identify even many of her family members on most occasions. But when she came to church, she would sit in the front row. She'd lift her hands for the worship songs, and she would know every word to every song. So somehow within her, she was enduring this horrible situation that she'd had. And she did endure it as positively as anyone could ever. Saw her sons married, and, and uh, it, it's just wonderful to see. But here's someone who's encountering the ultimate, I think, when you go from being the, one of the most brilliant people you'd ever know to someone who couldn't keep a thought straight. And uh, so in the midst of that, she was yielding herself to Jesus Christ. She won the race. The fifth and final principle is an important one, and that's this idea of fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. What does that really mean? What does that really mean to us? I think it means five different things. 
First, remember our lives of faith grow only by trusting Jesus Christ constantly for his direction, his wisdom, his healing, his listening, listening to hear his voice depending on him alone, to a moment-by-moment dialogue in prayer with the God of the universe. It's praying without ceasing. It's even having God communicate with you in dreams. I think some of you maybe have this gift sometimes. I've known people who do. But it's growing in Christ, growing in our faith by focusing on him and listening and being in communication with him on a moment-by-moment basis. Second, and so importantly, it is important every day to set aside time to be with God. And we always say we're, we're too busy. Find some good time. Uh, I was a night owl, and so I always did mine late at night. Most people do theirs early in the morning. Uh, but find a time. Mary will be talking a lot more about this uh, subject next week. His word convicts us when we stray from his path. His word fills us with living water and satisfies our deepest desires. It is only in God's word that we can be sure that we know that we're in his will. So have that time set aside. The third one, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, he gives us the eyes to see people as he does. And he gives us the idea of where we could go to be part of his work that is going on around us. But without that communication, without that tie to Jesus, we don't, we're oblivious to what is going on around us. And one of the, the, the most moving times I ever saw this was on an airplane ride. And I was going to D.C. to see my daughter. And I was sitting next to this really uh, nice-looking young lady. uh, And we got in a little bit of a conversation. And she mentioned that she she had gone to law school at Georgetown. And I mentioned my daughter had applied at Georgetown. We got into a little conversation like that. And and then she said that she was the, she was in charge. She She went to Georgetown Law School and how now... Instead of practicing law, she, she was a, the coordinator of all the applicants to Georgetown Law School. And then, then I asked her the next question, which this is just what we were learning in Blessed, by the way, you know, asking her about her life. And I said, where, where have you been? She says, well, I was back at my hometown. And I said, well, what was the occasion? And she said, her mother, who was the patron saint of the community, the greatest she, her family was wealthy, and they did a lot for the community. And her mom was the patron saint of the community. And her mom was run over by a drunk driver in just right in front of her house. And so she had gone back for the funeral. She was going back on the flight to D.C. And she said, I, I, I'm so numb still from this that I can't even talk. And I don't even know how I can talk to you, but I know that this is like therapy for me. This is a good thing for me to have this time together. And, you know, we never know who's going to be next to us, do they? We never know where the needs may be. And uh, at the end of the flight, she said, you know, God really, God put you next to me today. Because I've been so lonely. I've missed my mom so much. And... Uh, prayed with her on the plane, and you know, I hope she's, I, I'm sure she's recovered. She was a person of faith, by the way. So that was even making it harder when your mom, who's done so many wonderful things, is run over by a drunk driver. So be looking for those opportunities that are around us. Fourthly, he gives us an example of who we are to be as people who will endure suffering, shame, hostility, so that that we do not grow weary and lose heart. You know, I, I think a lot of us really actually in our country are really just chickens about talking to people about God. <laughs> Tell the truth. Because, and you know what we're afraid of? We're just afraid that someone will laugh at us or make fun of us because we believe in these Christian principles. Isn't that the truth? We're not going to get gunned down well, in most places in our country, <laughs> for sharing our faith. And uh, I was thinking about this, and when I, I started Young Life at Blue Valley High School, and I only knew, it, whenever you start a Young Life group, 
you don't know anyone. You know, but I knew two or three people that went to our church. And so I was going to, to, to uh, talk to one of the girls who was a cheerleader and was, went to our church. She was kind of the, the one that was helping us get it going. And so it, it was the end of a football game, and I did kind of a little bit of a gymnastic jump over the fence. And I made the mistake of doing that right in front of the yell leaders, who began to, to, to uh, give points to how, how effectively I had gotten over the fence. <laughs> and they got out their megaphones, and they said, and they, they were doing, the, and the whole crowd is still there. And so the whole crowd is there, and I'm, and I'm just, I'm just kind of like ducking my head, like I was so embarrassed. And then, you know what happened with that? Afterwards, they went up to the cheerleader and said, who is that guy? And they said, well, he's Bob. He's starting a young life. And they said, well, what? And they showed up at the Young Life Club the next week, and, and several of them over the course of that year became Christians. And I just think, can we, why don't we just be fools for Christ's sake? <laughs> right? I could have shared other things, like when I really was going to get ready to be killed or something like that. But, but I think this is where it is for most of us in the United States. People are going to make fun of us. They may not like us. And that's the main reason we don't open up to share uh, our faith. Fifth, he gives us the discernment to deal with the devil who stalks about like a roaring lion, seeking to devour whom he may. And you know, this is, a, this is an area here, again, that a lot of us don't like to touch because it's scary. It's spooky. But I want to tell you, the devil is doing just this. He is stalking us. He's stalking every one of us. And if you don't think he's there, probably he really, you're avoiding a lot of situations that God might call you into. Well, I remember, you know, throughout my ministry, many situations of demonic things, but one of the ones that just stands out so vividly is I took one of my neighbors up to the, to the house to meet Richard Beach to, for Richard to share with him about Christ. And so he went up, and Richard went through the, the four spiritual laws and, and then asked him if he'd like to receive Christ, and he shook his head like this, and he said, would you like to pray, John? And he shook his head. And then Richard started through the prayer, and John couldn't open his mouth. And we noticed that he was sweating profusely. His eyes were rolling around in his head. He could not literally open his mouth to say anything. He was wanting to say the words, but he could not. And he himself had been involved in all sorts of, I would think, say, demonic type activity. And so Richard says, okay, well, let's just pray for him. So we prayed for him, and immediately he went, he just went limp. He just said the words, prayed, received Christ. Well, in that time, the next, the next day was Thursday night, and we had a Thursday night meeting where we studied the Bible. And then if anyone had ever become a, had become a Christian, which oftentimes they did almost every week, uh, would come and share their testimony. So he shares his testimony. He says, well, Bob brought me up here, and I didn't really want to come, but I did. And then they got to talking, and I prayed, and I received Jesus Christ. But the one thing that was really strange about it, he says, I couldn't even speak. And then they prayed for me, and this is what he said, and the demons left me, is what he said. And I thought, because we didn't, Richard and I really didn't exactly, we kind of thought it was like demonic, but we weren't that sure. You know, We weren't going to name it a demon, but when he named it, he himself named it a demon, I thought, well, yeah, I think it, it did look like a dumb demon had come upon my friend John. The point is that there are spirits around us, there is spiritual activity, and that we need to be praying that God will show us how to act and interact. And so today I've, I've hit on a lot of things about how we can center our lives around Jesus. Do you have a coach or are you a coach? Um, have you rid your lives of encumbrances? Have you confessed your sins? Are you willing to endure in the race and ready to battle the devil? I love uh, St. Peter's, I mean, St. Uh, Patrick's breastplate. And I'd like this to be our closing prayer today. Let us, let us pray.
Christ be with me. Christ within me. Christ behind me. Christ before me. Christ to comfort and restore me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ in quiet. Christ in danger. Christ in hearts of all that love me. Christ in the mouth of friends and stranger. Amen.